Welcome to the Gruber Artificial Future Podcast. I'm Pete Gruber. This is our uh, somewhat informal artificial AI podcast that we do every Wednesday morning. And um, today one of the topics is going to be um, cloning, voice cloning. So I asked ChatGPT4, give me a uh, voice cloning themed background. And um, after about six tries, this is what it came up with. And I kind of like the colors and, uh, you know, the uh, some of the, um, uh, the lines in this. So that's what you're seeing behind us. And for those of you on Instagram, by the way, um, we solved that streaming problem with the green screen issue. So uh, you should be able to see not only the images that we're going to post throughout this podcast, but also the background image. And uh, as always, um, let us know where you're coming in from. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, and uh, if you take an issue with anything that's been said or have additional information, this is highly collaborative. I'd love to hear from you and uh, see what your thoughts are. Um, there's so much AI news every week that um, it, there's, there's no problem gathering uh, information for this podcast. And um, our goal is to educate, edify, uh, tantalize, uh, kick in critical thinking skills, and just simply discuss what is this transition into AI going to be like? Uh, do we need to fear? Do we need to embrace? Or combinations of the two? And uh, what are some of the, um, of the issues surrounding this uh, wonderful new technology that's coming in rapidly and uh, beginning to uh, take over? Um, one of the things that happened last week, big um, uh, event, Google's DeepMind has used a large language model to crack a famous unsolved problem in pure mathematics. We all suspected that, uh, you know, we have taken um, this kind of thing as far as we can, and as AI begins to get involved, it may just begin to solve some problems that... Uh, we aren't able to as humans, especially in the field of uh, healthcare and disease. And uh, so anyway, in a paper published by Nature Today, the researchers say this is the first time a large language model has been used to discover a solution to a long-standing scientific puzzle, producing verifiable and valuable new information that did not previously exist. Now, this is the real clincher. It's not in the training data, they say. It wasn't even known. So AI actually did create, and that's pretty exciting because large language models typically have a reputation for making things up, not for providing new facts. In this case, Google's DeepMind new tool called FunSearch could change that. It shows that they can indeed, AI can indeed make discoveries if they're coaxed to do so, and if you throw out the majority of what they come up with. That was kind of funny, so you have to screen it. Now, it's called Fun Search, not because it's fun, but it comes from the term uh, function. And um, they plan to continue a streak of discoveries in fundamental math and computer science um, with um, uh, DeepMind being at the helm of this project. Um, Looks like we've got some people chiming in. Clark Schwartz is here from Gilbert. Thanks for joining us. That's not too far away here. Ingemar is here. Thank you for joining us, Ingemar. And uh, Robert Christensen, as a Monotracer MTE-150 owner, I wonder if you can confirm the rumor that early Tesla Roadsters use the AC Propulsion 150KW air-cooled motor. They do not. Uh, we have a T0, actually, and it was a um, hand-wound uh, AC propulsion-type uh, motor, 150 kW, I believe. The um, problem that they found using the AC propulsion drivetrain in the Tesla Roadster, which was mostly analog technology and hand-wound motors, they actually had to merge the motors with the inverters because of uh, differences between them during the winding process. That was the first problem. The second one was highly unreliable. So what they ended up doing was they subcontracted to a company in Taiwan, Chroma, to build a uh, solid-state inverter, a uh, digital inverter, basically. And uh, the, um, uh, the motors, I believe, were made in-house. Now, I'd have to check that. 
I'm not sure anymore about that. But there isn't uh, anything left from AC propulsion in the Tesla Roadster, except for a lingering um, suspicion that Tesla may have used some of their technology regarding charging, which created some heartache for AC propulsion, who for a few years attempted to uh, get some um, uh, royalties for the use of that technology. Uh, Niels joined us from Denmark. Uh, he says, what problem did they solve? Well, okay, um, I knew you were going to ask that, Niels. And uh, I don't completely understand it, but let me tell you what they say here. Um, Pun Search was able to come up with code that produced a correct and previously unknown solution to a cap set problem, which involves finding the largest size of a certain type of set. Then they say, imagine plotting dots on a graph paper. The cap set problem is like trying to figure out how many dots you can put down without three of them ever forming a straight line. There you have it. <laughs> um, what's cool about this is they say that the key advantage is that this now can be used to find solutions to a wide range of problems, uh, and that's because it produces code, a recipe for generating the solution, rather than the solution itself. So different code will solve different problems. And uh, they say that fun searches results are also easier to understand. Um, a recipe that is often clearer than the weird mathematical solutions that it produces. Now I've got a picture here that I want to pop up, Jesse. It's called Puzzle-1. And after reading this, I was inspired. And um, I've been playing with this puzzle now since I was in grammar school, actually. And I used to bet kids that uh, I'd give them whatever um, uh, the amount was at the time, 10, 20 bucks or whatever. Probably as a kid, it wasn't that high. Whatever. If they could solve this problem. And um, simply put, it's, um, it's a figure of three power stations and three houses up above. It'll pop up here in a second, I think. Puzzle dash one. And the goal is to draw a line from each power station to a house, only three of them, of course, and do that with each of the power stations without ever crossing or intersecting the, um, uh, the power lines. Are you finding it or not? There we go. Perfect. All right. So you can see my prompt, and I tried at least a dozen of them. Run one wire from each circle to all three squares without ever crossing wires. And, of course, it crossed wires each time. So then I said, important, do not cross wires. I'm shouting at it now, right? It continued to cross wires. So I'm perplexed and puzzled, and I called Jesse over, and I said, Jesse, this thing, is, this thing is dumb as a post. It's not intelligent. It's artificial, you know, dumb post. And he says, it's probably dealing in a three-dimensional mode. So we inserted two-dimensional mode, and he was right. Um, remember, AI apparently thinks beyond our capabilities and visualizes things that uh, we aren't able or we aren't seeing. So the net result was, and this is puzzle number two, we got to throw this image up. And it pretty much confirmed what I have been aware of ever since I was a kid trying to trick people into solving this problem. So now it says, the task that you have asked to visualize is a known impossible problem on a two-dimensional plane. It's a representation of the classic problem of drawing a complete bipartite graph, K3, 3, without edges crossing. According to Kurbatowski's theorem, such a graph cannot be drawn without some edges crossing on a flat two-dimensional surface. Therefore, the illustration shows the circles and squares without any connecting lines, as any attempt to draw the wires would result in crossing. So all those frustrated kids that never could solve the problem, despite some uh, you know, tantalizing monetization possibility, um, should not be frustrated because even AI couldn't do it. So that was my version of solving a complicated mathematical problem. Robert Christensen, oh, we've got him already. Um, oh, there he is. Thanks for the comprehensive reply. Oh, you're more than welcome, uh, Robert. We, um, we, of course, work on roadsters all the time, and uh, we are now developing a roadster knowledge base 
uh, using the uh, capabilities now of developing custom GPTs. And uh, we started to use it yesterday and found that it's um, quite remarkably reliable as we anticipated. Um, we fed in all of the information that uh, Tesla, Elon, um, uh, released about a month or so ago, uh, creating um, an open source uh, release of all of the Tesla Roadster information. And uh, once we fed that in, you can type in error codes, you can type in descriptions, and it will give you everything that has been assembled or released by Tesla. And by the way, there's more coming from Tesla. And with the Tesla Roadster, we've got years of knowledge base that we've accumulated. It's fundamentally um, symptom versus solution type um, processes. And we're feeding that into this uh, Tesla Roadster knowledge base as well. Uh, Mustafa staff says that's really magnificent. Thank you. All right, so here's something else. It's not quite AI related, but I figured that this would be something that would get one of the people in social media here pretty excited. The headline on this was nuclear fusion breakthrough. This physicist helped to achieve the first ever energy gain. And her name is Annie Critcher. Her team is at the U.S. National Ignition Facility, or NIF, designing fusion experiments that generated more energy than they consumed. So there was a lot of optimism uh, last week as uh, this was released. What she had done was help the U.S. Department of Energy NIF facility, NIF, to achieve a goal that had eluded labs around the world for decades, compressing atoms so tightly that their nuclei fuse and generate more energy than the reaction consumes. Now, the overtones or the, uh, the upshot here is that this may be the first time that we have created something like perpetual motion or unlimited energy. But after reaching this experimental milestone known as ignition, the pressure was on for a repeat performance. Now, the lab that's working on this, by the way, cost $3.5 billion housed at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in California. Now you might ask yourself, how can any um, lab extract this much funding for something? Well, the answer came pretty quickly as I continue to read. This lab was designed to bolster nuclear weapon science. So again, creating weapons of mass destruction. There's a lot of money for that type of thing. But the good news is that the advances there could also help to develop nuclear fusion as a safe, clean, and almost limitless source of energy. Now, the NIF experiment came as a surprise to many, and it was last year, apparently, because they had been, um, they feared that this was beyond reach. And uh, apparently, Annie, as the lead designer of the main fusion experiment, um, set out to prove that NIF could really, could reliably achieve ignition. Well, this was on the 30th of July, apparently. That shot paid off. The facility's 192 laser beams delivered 2.05 megajoules of energy to a frozen pellet of hydrogen isotopes deuter uh, deuterium and tritium, suspended in a gold cylinder. The resulting implosion caused the isotopes to release energy as they had fused into helium, generating temperatures six times hotter than the core of the sun. The reactions produced a record 3.88 megajoules of fusion energy. Um, so anyway, this is pretty exciting because, what do you think, Jesse? Got any thoughts on this? Sorry, I'm doing the, the show here. What, what do you mean? Oh, your thoughts on this fusion breakthrough? The fusion breakthrough that happened back in July? Yes, yeah. Well, let's continue. He's, yeah. he's, uh, he's busy um, juggling. Uh, he looks like a musician back there with keyboards and drums, and you know he's uh, basically operating everything back there. Um, again, the, um, the benefit of this is it will um, allow... Uh, test detonations um, to, again, test nuclear weapons. and um, uh, But at the same time, it could unlock or be the, um, the source of unlimited energy. 
going forward. Um, and then Niels, yes, this is just a repeat of what they did a year ago. Uh, was it the Q underscore plasma value this time? It doesn't say here, uh, Niels. Let me see if there's anything else here. Um, with the formal ignition goal under her belt, they say, Critcher is already working on a fresh series of experiments that aim to boost the yield yet again by delivering even more laser energy to a thicker target capsule. And this could again uh, represent another step towards NIF's goal of achieving tens of megajoules and beyond. Um, in the long run, they say that uh, this could uh, position and begin work on a prototype laser fusion energy reactor. A much more peaceful, um, you know, progress or process than uh, working on uh, weapons of annihilation, having energy sources that are unlimited. Um, she says now, Annie, it's not a question of if, but when fusion energy will arrive, and she's hopeful that these laser methods will play a part. All right, we've got another picture to pop up here. Let's see if I can find that one. Nope, I stand corrected. Although this is something that Jesse may want to chime in on because I watched him using it. Chat GPT has a capability now. Screenshot to code. Upload a screenshot of a website and it will convert it to clean HTML. Um, and Jesse, I believe that I saw you using that the other day. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. You're, you're using ChatGPT for code, is that what you're saying? Yeah, you were sitting there and uh, looking at our old website, which we're reinventing or recreating, and uh, you had the uh, ChatGPT screenshot to code converter up. I don't think I was using the same tool you're talking about. I was just asking ChatGPT code-specific questions. Okay, all right. Well, that's pretty exciting. Um, according to uh, people in the industry, that uh, web designers' jobs may be altering because ChatGPT and large language models are going to be able to uh, do some of this type of work. All right, so Australian researchers, and here's an image that we can pop up, and this one's called Deep South. Um, they are putting together in Australia a supercomputer that's designed to emulate the world's most efficient learning machine, a neuromorphic monster capable of the same estimated 228 trillion synaptic operations per second that human brains can handle. Um, they say that it all relies on absolutely gargantuan amounts of computing power. And uh, currently, uh, you know, AI servers uh, using NVIDIA GPUs um, will be um, most likely consuming more energy annually <clears throat> to achieve this goal than many small countries. In a world desperately trying to decarbonize, that kind of energy load is a massive drag. Of course, what we talked about earlier, if we can get fusion energy involved in this, then that's going to solve some of these problems or mitigate this. Um, so they say, but as often happens, nature has already solved this problem. Our own necktop computers, and I didn't hear that term before, necktop computers, brains, are still the state of the art, capable of learning super quickly from small amounts of messy, noisy data, or processing the equivalent of a billion, billion mathematical operations every second while consuming a paltry 20 watts of energy. So there you have it. It looks like uh, the human brain is still the, um, the top dog in this category. So <clears throat> this particular team that's working at Western Sydney University in Australia, and they're working on this deep south neuromorphic supercomputer. It'll be the first machine ever built that's capable of simulating spiking neural networks at the scale of a human brain. Looks like Niels is chiming in. He said, well, the required Q underscore total is some 500 times higher to create the plasma, form the steam, etc. So a long way to go, plus the tritium problem, strong neutron radiation, and huge cost per plant. Niels, I knew that you were going to have some expertise. Thank you for chiming in. 
Um, so they continue in this article about this neuromorphic supercomputer. Progress is in our understanding of how brains compute using neurons is hampering our inability to simulate brain-like networks at scale. Stimulating spiking neural networks on standard computers using GPUs and multi-core CPUs is just too slow and power intensive. But they say that their system will change that. The platform will progress our understanding of the brain and develop brain scale computing applications in diverse fields, including sensing, biomedical, robotics, space, and large-scale AI applications. This Deep South computer, uh, neuromorphic computer, is scheduled to go online April of 2024, spring of next year. The research team expects it'll be able to process massive amounts of data at high speed while being much smaller than other supercomputers and consuming much, much less energy thanks to its spiking neural network approach. Uh, the goal of the enterprise is to move AI processing a step closer to the way the human brain does things, as well as learning more about the brain and hopefully making advances that will be relevant in other fields. Neil says, by the way, Eric Lerner's LPP fusion looks better. None of the above problems, but they have troubles too. It's exciting that we're getting closer to things like this. All right. So we covered my uh, experiment with uh, ChatGPT trying to solve a complex uh, uh, mathematical problem. Um, moving along here, Microsoft's new AI trend, um, or AI needs just three seconds of audio to clone a voice. And I think we have an image here. Uh, it's actually the image behind us. This is AI's representation of voice cloning. So what they're saying here is, Val E can even mimic a speaker's emotions and acoustic environment. So Microsoft's new voice cloning AI can simulate a speaker's voice with remarkable accuracy, and all it needs to get started is three seconds of sampling of them talking. And that's a major change, apparently, because voice cloning technology has been around for a while. It's not new, but uh, with, this, um, with this Google app, they're going to produce audio that sounds just like you in a very short period of time. You can then use the clone to hear yourself or read any text that you like. For a writer, here's some applications. A writer, this can be useful for creating an author-narrated audio version of their book without spending days in a recording studio. A voice actor, meanwhile, might clone their voice so that they can rent out their AI for projects they don't have time to tackle themselves. There you go. Basically cloning yourself in that scenario. Um, they say that shorter source samples typically lead to voice clones that sound less realistic. And... Um, the old method was reciting 50 predetermined sentences or uploading a clip of you saying anything at all. Some services will ask for hours of audio to train their AI, while others will boast about five seconds. Well, this one is three seconds. And they say that often when you use these other services, you get voice cloning that um, uh, a shorter example, again, leads into cloning that sounds like a robot trying to impersonate a person, while the longer clips can result in AI-generated audio that sounds just like the original speaker. Um, so anyway, Microsoft's new voice cloning, it's Val-E, V-A-L-L. -L. It bucks this trend. It generates audio that sounds remarkably like the original speaker from voice samples as short as three seconds. Um... On this page, they say Microsoft has also demonstrated how AI can mimic a speaker's emotions with an, and, with, and the acoustic environment of a sample. So if the speaker sounds angry, Val E will generate angry sounding audio. If the original clip sounds like it was recorded over the phone, the AI can generate audio that matches those acoustics as well. Um, how it works, they say. 
And AI is typically only as good as its training data. And Microsoft opted to use Meta's LibriLite, an audio library containing 60,000 hours of speech from more than 7,000 English speakers to train Val-E. This means, they say, that AI's training set was hundreds of times larger than those used to train existing voice cloning systems, according to the research paper. So there's a sales pitch. That's why it's better, they're claiming. When Valley is presented with a new voice to clone, it breaks the three-second audio clip into bits, uh, into bits that Microsoft calls acoustic tokens. Using those tokens and its training data, it can then predict what the voice would sound like uh, using or saying other phrases. So the big picture here is if you go back to that list of voice cloning search results, you'll find that links to articles dealing on how the AI is being used for nefarious purposes. You're going to have to Google this because we don't have that image uh, to pop up here. So when the bad actors get involved in this, what's going to happen? And they have some predictions here. There's the cyber criminal who cloned the boss's voice to trick an employee into transferring company cash into their bank account. And warnings to seniors that bad actors can now clone the voices of their grandchildren to extort money. You know, this actually happened to our neighbor, um, Osa. Um, she's a widow. She was in her 80s. She came over to our house one day and said, can you drive me to the Western Union office? My grandson is in trouble and I need to wire him money right away. My wife had the foresight to ask a few more questions. And uh, we eventually discovered that this was a scam. She found it odd that uh, she's from Denmark, by the way, that instead of calling her by whatever you use for grandmother in, in, uh, in uh, Danish, he said grandma, and he said he'd never called me that before. So, um, but anyway, this voice cloning technology is going to make those kinds of occurrences much more rampant. All right, let's see if we have any other uh, questions. Uh, yeah, Niels is saying, yeah, we're getting closer. It's about 20 years away and always will be. Not even in Jesse's lifetime. Jesse. Did he just say your, your uh, lifetime is about 20, these guys 20 are more years? Young, Niels. 20 years? Yeah. yeah, that's weird. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. The, the whole... Um, Saying it's always twenty years away, it'll always be. That's been a known thing in the, you know, that um, industry for a long time because people have never been able to achieve fusion ignition. But yeah, we achieved it. So I don't really know what you're referring to. Commercialization, maybe you're talking about commercialization. Will be twenty years away and always will be. Who knows when that'll happen? But proving the math and taking it from theory to actual working math in real in a real world environment. It's already happened in all of our lifetimes. It happened in July. Interesting. Well, I plan to be around in 20 years, guys, because I have an um, event that I'm going to go to. It's a uh, brewery in Bavaria, just uh, outside of Munich, called Weinstefana. And it is the oldest beer brewery in the world. It was originally founded during the Crusades in the year 1040. And in 2040, they're going to have a thousand-year reunion, and I plan to be there hoisting a liter of Weisstefana Dunkelbier, uh, Hefeweizen, and uh, so I have to be around in 20 years. That would make me 92 at that time. Will you be going live and doing a live podcast? Almost from that likely, show? yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. You're right. All right, so a general-purpose robot is entering the workforce. And they say that this AI-powered humanoid could be your next coworker. It's a tech startup called Sanctuary AI. They have unveiled a general-purpose robot designed to perform many workplace tasks. And Jesse, I'm going to ask you something here. There is a, a text file in the image folder under this podcast, and there's a link there. If we could throw up the video of that robot, that would be wonderful. And how it functions, how it maneuvers. Um, it's uh, comparable to what we saw with the um, Optimus robot that uh, Tesla is uh, pretty proud of. And it's amazing how lifelike these things are beginning to get. Not in appearance necessarily, I mean, other than the fact that they have two arms, two legs, one head, two eyes, you know, very human looking. But uh, there isn't uh, any skin on these, and uh, there we go.
no chance to get audio. Okay. They go through a description here. Uh, they um, uh, they like you to pay close attention to the movement of the fingers, kind of like Optimus. It looked very human. And his name is Phoenix. Friendly guy, huh? <laughs> Human-like intelligence, they talk about. We'll get into that in the article. And you know, it's not that tall. Five foot seven, 150 pounds or something like that. There we go. Payload, 55 pounds. So this is... Um, an attempt to get these humanoid robots to work with humans. And the challenge is that robots have worked alongside people for decades. And that was kind of eye-opening for me because if you think about it, these things have already been in production facilities, but they don't look humanoid. And traditionally, they've been incredibly specialized, they say. A bot on a General Motors assembly line, for example, might move pieces of metal from one place to another over and over and over again. It's kind of like an automated conveyor belt or a picking system, but it is a robot. Um, and this has meant that business owners would need to purchase multiple and usually expensive robots if they wanted to automate multiple tasks. Well, this general purpose robot apparently is going to change that in that it can handle a variety of tasks and it would allow employees to automate whatever is most pressing on a given day. So Frank is out sick that day, the humanoid comes over, and maybe he's able to function in a similar fashion to Frank. But building a bot that can do a lot is, as you'd expect, a lot harder than building one that does things over and over again. So they designed the Phoenix, the one that you just saw, to be the most sensor-rich and physically capable humanoid ever built. And this is according to Glenrow Rose. Uh, we'll find out maybe what their function or his function is. So this is a Canada-based company called Sanctuary AI. It's one of several companies that's attempting to overcome the challenge and bring a general purpose robot to market. And on May 16th, they, avail they unveiled the sixth generation robot named Phoenix. Um, the details, oh, by the way, uh, it's uh, Gordy Rose is the co-founder and CEO of this company, Sanctuary AI. So the details, five foot seven tall, a little shorter than me, 155 pounds, same weight as me, capable of lifting 55 pounds. Well, I can do better than that. I lift weights, all right? <laughs> and uh, it has 20 degrees of freedom and haptic sensors that allow it to perform tasks that require dexterity and precision, such as labeling packages, picking fruit. And if you remember, Optimus, the Tesla robot, um, was actually picking up an egg and transferring it to the other hand without breaking it. That's pretty remarkable because you have to have some tactile sensation and just the right amount of pressure in order to avoid crushing that egg. Now, according to Sanctuary, Phoenix also has human-like intelligence thanks to a proprietary AI control system called Carbon. It acts as the bot's brain and can be trained to complete new tasks in computer simulations. Alternatively, Phoenix can learn from demonstration. Now, this is important. With this approach, a human uses a VR headset to see what the bot sees and a special rig to guide it through completing new tasks. Now, remember, just like Tesla with their auto driving or with their autopilot software, they finally realized that, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of code wasn't quite as valuable as replicating human driving. So this may be another breakthrough in, and accelerate the uh, adoption and the uh, implementation of humanoid robots in the workforce. They say that this setup can be used for remote control as well, the VR headset, which would enable people to work from at home prevent injuries due to physical labor, and increase the number of jobs available to people with disabilities. Good point. Sanctuary demonstrated the potential of robot remote work with a pilot test at, at Mark's retail store near its headquarters in January. 
Over the course of one week, a human guided the startup's fifth generation general robots, uh, a robot through 110 different tasks. Very cool. All right. I've got another chart I want to throw up here, guys. This one is called Value of AI. So generative AI is the latest technology creating value across many different sectors. And in the innovation chain, breakthrough technology is powered by infrastructure and inputs, creating new hardware, running on platforms of operators and enablers that then benefit uh, the economy at large. And this was kind of interesting to me because they listed the steam engine. The infrastructure required was steel and coal, obviously. Hardware manufacturers, trains and ships, operators and enablers, railroad and ship operators, and application beneficiaries, trade. The telephone came along. Now, bear in mind here, you're beginning to see here that we're getting into the information age now, and it went back to the telephone. It required telephone cables, electricity, the hardware was telephones, operators, network operators, and applications, services, and trades. Then came the internal combustion engine. And this was a pretty big step because it replaced the steam engine. Now, instead of using steel and coal, we use steel, oil, and auto parts. Hardware manufacturers, now car manufacturers, operators, service, insurance, dealerships, and application, retail, leisure, commuters, and of course, business, you know, moving things around. Now we've got television. Again, information age uh, entry. Towers and satellites was the infrastructure. Hardware was television sets, operators and enablers, TV networks. And the application beneficiaries, advertising, subscription business models. Okay. Then we've got computer entering the, um, uh, this chart. Semiconductors uh, was the infrastructure. Hardware manufacturers initially were mainframe. Now it's PC manufacturers and electronic manufacturers. Operators and enablers, they mentioned IBM. They left out digital equipment. Burroughs, Data General, Wang Computers, Prime Computers. Uh, professional services, manufacturing, and aerospace. Of course, it revolutionized business. Uh, what it began to replace was the mechanical typewriters. Um, teletypes. Um, now here we've got internet. Now we're getting smack into the information age. Routers and data centers were the inputs and the infrastructure. Um, smartphones, iOS, Android, and social media, e-commerce, and the gig economy. And then finally, we have another entry here, which is generative AI. And they mention the infrastructure and inputs as the cloud. Hardware manufacturers, graphic GPUs, processing units, um, operators and enablers, large language models, and the applications or the application beneficiaries. Well, this list is way too short, but text generation, programming, image, and video generation. So there you have it. Smack in the information age, and it looks like AI definitely is uh, uh, the cherry on top. All right. Then uh, Neil says, no, the Q plasma value has been going up steadily. When it finally crosses one, they call it I ignition, uh, they call it ignition, but it has to go up 500 times further to work. And then uh, uh, Vikra Pomodar Comedian says, this is very informative. Thanks. Well, thank you. Um, all right, so chat behind, the AI behind chat GPT is bringing a toy to life. Now, you know, I've thought about this often. I have a lot of children. I have a lot of grandchildren. And um, the way that children learn is by exposure to us, you know, learning language skills. My 13-month-old granddaughter now is in a um, mixed environment of Hispanic and European. And uh, the Hispanic team is winning because they're teaching her Spanish and she responds to words. They're also teaching her to sign. It is amazing to watch my 13-month-old sign that uh, she wants more or that she doesn't want any more, that she's done. 
you know, and of course, waving goodbye, which is the universal sign language. But um, I've often thought that if we expose children to um, large language models, something like a Alexa that's constantly watching, observing, teaching, and training in a fun way, that we could really expand and develop the brain much more rapidly than, you know, uh, grandparents or the parents communicating and interacting with their children. Well, this story comes from one of uh, Elon's uh, ex-crushes, Grimes. And, you know, for the life of me, I couldn't find what her first name was. It turns out that Grimes is like um, uh, Elvis or like Prince. There's only one name. Her real name is Claire something Boucher. But anyway, it's pop artist Grimes, they say, that has teamed up with Silicon Valley startup Curio to create a puffed toy rocket that can understand and talk to kids using the same AI technology that's powering ChatGPT. Piqued my interest, all right? So the background on this is, in April, ex-user Rune, R-O-O-N, tweeted a prediction that every last thing in the future will be animated with intelligence, including children's teddy bears. Well, this post apparently caught Grimes's eye, who has three children with Elon, and she said this would be great if safe. Um, she wrote in a, um, a reply to Rune's tweet. She says, parenting is so hard. I'd love if my kids were hanging out with um, a smart equivalent to a culture ship mind in a teddy bear. That's probably too much to ask. Well, being a public figure, apparently um, someone was paying attention to this tweet. And along comes a company, um, Curio. And they developed Grok, short for Groquette, with input and investment from Grimes. She is also, by the way, the voice in this AI toy, which is, again, built on ChatGPT's language model. And it gives Grok, has nothing to do, by the way, with X's Grok, the ability to interpret what kids are saying and respond in language that they can understand. Again, I'm becoming curious about this. Um, apparently, there was a um, sci-fi writer, um, Ian M. Banks, who wrote Culture, uh, or the Culture series. And... Um, there's, uh, let's see what they say here. He's carrying on, okay, conversation with uh, children. And uh, having toys powered by AI would, of course, improve the intelligence of our children. Now, this toy that they're talking, um, you're talking to it, and it's talking back, according to Sam Eaton, who's a president and chief toy maker at Curio. You're imagining, and it's challenging you. Now, Curio... <clears throat> is selling a beta version of this Grok toy on its website for $99. And guys, there's a picture of this. If we can throw up the picture called Grimes. And what you'll see is uh, Claire Boucher, or Grimes, more popularly known in pop culture, um, holding a um, one of these um, uh, devices, and you can see that it's talking to her. Um, you can buy this for $99, that price will get you the AI toy. It'll be delivered in 2024, as well as a 60-day subscription to Curio Plus, which appears to be a requirement if you want to be able to converse with Grok. There will always be some baseline functionality, uh, they say, without a subscription. But with a subscription, you'll be able to have a conversational capability, as well as new features from the Curio team as they are released. Currently, there's no word <clears throat> on um, what the uh, company expects to charge for a subscription after the 60 days. We do know that the next two toys in its lineup will be Grimm, which is an alien that loves the color pink, and Gabo, an enthusiastic robot. Um, playing safe now, <clears throat> the idea of an AI toy that listens to children will no doubt raise red flags for some parents. 
but Curio is taking steps to assuage any assuage. That's how you pronounce that. Any privacy concerns telling WAPO that Grok won't collect or store voice data. Just like my Amazon Alexa, uh, you're being told that it's even though it's listening, it's not collecting anything. All right, uh, Gruber Service says parents should talk to kids. Absolutely, that's where it all starts. Bill Nye, the Russian spy, says that's his baby mama. There you go. Bill Nye, the Russian spy, also says I disagree with AI nannies. That's scary. That's just lazy parenting. Another one from Gruber Service. That must be someone here, I would uh, venture to say. Parents should really be the ones talking to kids. What are you considering intelligence? Okay. And then uh, Niels is chiming in. He said, maybe Val E and a Grok-like thing could help decode whale or elephant speak. Absolutely. There's already, I think we've had that in previous podcasts, that they're beginning to map out animal language and that the goal here is in the future to be able to actually communicate with your cat, your dog, or those wild animals. That'd be pretty cool, right? Bear comes up on you while you're hiking and uh, you're able to converse with him and say, now you really don't want to eat me. I've got some pepper spray here and I don't want to destroy your olfactory system. Or I've got a, a nine millimeter in my pocket, and if you push this too far, I'm going to have to waste you. I'm sorry, I went off on a tangent there, but uh, Vika Potamar comedian says I've always felt in the longer run that robots are best suited to bring up children to avoid generational curses and mitigate the difficulty of bringing up human children. And of course, passing on prejudices and biases, and yeah, it uh, with pop. Properly regulated AI, and I hate that term, you know, it would improve the chances that the children would grow up a bit more well-adjusted. All right. Uh, great comments, by the way. Um, this thing with Grimes uh, opened up a whole bunch of discussion. Um, I have here her full name. <clears throat> it is Claire Elise Boucher. And by the way, the middle name is kind of interesting because remember Elon... Um, with the Tessa Roadster, was uh, using the Lotus Elise as a clone car to convert to electric. I don't think it was him that picked the Elise. I think that was back to the Martin Eberhardt and Mark Tarpening days. But it's interesting that that's in the name. Um, Claire Elise Boucher, also known as Grimes, was born on March 17, 1988, and started her career by writing songs in 2007. Uh, Boucher released her first album three years later and has created four studio albums since. Well, hats off to Claire or Grimes uh, for um, experimenting with uh, using AI with children. be interesting to see if uh, we get more posts about that and how that all works out. All right. We have some additional images here. One of them is sun worship, and I found this one humorous. Once we pop that up there, there's, of course, some suspicion that um, we have repeated this before. So let's look at this. Humanity uh, researches AI. I can't quite read that. And uh, let me bring that up on mine here so you guys don't have to blow it up there. There we go. So humanity researches AI, and then humanity perfects AI. There we go. AI now perfects itself. Remember, that's what we're all terrified of. It's going to be smart. It's going to be able to replicate. It's going to be able to improve itself. And why are we necessary in the equation? And then AI enslaves humanity. This is right out of Hollywood, isn't it? But... The sun saves the day. A solar flare disables AI. And what do we do? Humans go back to worshiping the sun. I can't hear the laughter, so if any of you want to chime in and uh, let us know if you found that funny or not. Um, you know, there is, of course, a lot of uh, suspicion that um, uh, intelligence on this planet has been there before. And unfortunately, we've wiped ourselves out a few times. Um, you know, a lot of uh, 
legends, uh, the Atlanteans, for example, who allegedly had a city that was very dystopian. <clears throat> they, um, they were able to uh, read minds. They had technology. They had fusion energy or something like it because they had perpetual energy. Um, and that the Ice Age might have been what wiped out some of this, uh, this previous, these uh, previous gains. Of course, there's no solid archaeological evidence that uh, corroborates any of this, uh, or it just hasn't been found yet, unless you consider the Ark of the Covenant to be that, or, you know. Uh, but anyway, so wanted to share that with you. So here's some good quotes. Um, our intuition about the future is linear, but the reality of information technology is exponential. And that makes a profound difference, according to Ray Kurzweil. If I take 30 steps linearly, I get to 30. If I take 30 steps exponentially, I get to a billion. Thank you, Ray, for chiming in. Let's see what else we've got here. All right. AI and social contracts that stipulate that people clearly indicate how much of an article they wrote uh, versus how much they relied on AI. Um, so this artist, we've got an image to throw up here. He asked AI for an image. And you know what? I did not put that in there, so scratch that. No, it is in there. It's called Adam's Art and AI. So he asked AI to generate an image based on his own artistic interpretation of something. He didn't complete it, and we've done this ourselves. We'll draw a rough drawing and then ask AI to finish it. In this case, AI actually gave him credit. And you can see Adam's art design and then AI art. What it doesn't indicate, however, is what percentage of the work is mine and what percentage of the work was actually AI, he says. But the purpose of this discussion is clear that uh, he's not the only genius in the room, he says. Then he says, a lack of transparency in content creation, especially on social media, raises significant ethical concerns. When individuals post AI-generated content without proper credit, not only does it mislead the audience, but it also undermines the value of authentic human creativity and effort. In practice, if left unchecked, it could lead to a culture where the authenticity of content is constantly in question, eroding trust in digital platforms. Well, folks, I think we're already there. The mistrust in media these days is worse than anything I've seen. I remember as a kid watching Walter Cronkite, who always closed his uh, news broadcast, and that's the way it was, July 30th, 1962. This guy had tremendous influence. He was like your gray-haired uncle. You hung on every word. You believed every word. And back then, the news was considered gospel. Today, we hear a lot about fake news, and uh, unfortunately, this generation is already very untrusting of anything that is... Uh, that is generated, um, almost like we're living in communist Russia with propaganda. All right, so he goes on. Additionally, it could create an uneven playing field where those with access to advanced AI tools have an unfair advantage in gaining notoriety or influence. Therefore, establishing a, a social contract to disclose AI involvement becomes crucial. Such disclosure not only promotes ethical standards, but also fosters a more authentic and trustworthy digital landscape where the distinction between human and AI contributors is clear and valued. All right. The, um, what, uh, what got him onto this article, by the way, or uh, motivated him to create it, he said, for what it's worth, an article that he read today on LinkedIn prompted this rant. 
The person that posted the article made no mention of whether or not they had used AI in the process of producing it, but having spent the last several months using multiple AI systems, I find it fairly easy to pick out the stuff that AI has written. I love his criteria, by the way. Now, this in particular, in this particular case, yes, I could be wrong, but when your first reaction is, what the, nobody talks like that, it's usually pretty good indication that AI was heavily involved. Yeah, so when your inarticulate buddy suddenly begins to use a vernacular that's distinctly different, that's probably a telltale sign that he's availing himself of ChatGPT4. And by the way, we're not embarrassed to admit we use it all the time here. We don't give disclosure because, well, uh, I didn't think it was necessary. And it's usually a combination. It's a blend. What I use ChatGPT for is like a thesaurus. I'll do my version, run it through ChatGPT4, and it just uh, expands the vocabulary tremendously. It condenses and says things in a much shorter sentence than I was able to do. So um, we do use it. Our call center people are using You're using it too, right? Yeah, yeah, using it uh, pretty much every day. Cool. Do you think universities and colleges will have to do citations with AI now going forward? You know, uh, I, I, I would hate to run a university or be a professor or somebody that administers those kinds of regulations because you're not going to keep it out of that kind of a process. And uh, eventually, it may just be the fact that humans uh, will rely 100% on AI to do their communication. We'll go on to better and other things. I don't know what that is yet. But, you know, there's a lot of talk about the age of abundance where uh, we're going to have robots that are doing all the menial work. Eventually, they'll do the complicated work as well. Eventually, AI will do all of our communication for us. Eventually, these guttural sounds I'm making with my mouth will be unnecessary because we'll have brain implants that are able to link telepathically or directly. So I, I can't predict, but I would hate to be somebody that uh, is regulating the use of these kinds of tools. You know, if you think about it, the average student can't come anywhere near AI's capability to generate content. So why not? Of course, the goal there is that, that they'll come back with is, well, you're supposed to be exercising and training your mind for a particular skill or capability, so later on you can have a career. And if you've passed the bar exam cheating with chat GPT-4, maybe you shouldn't be an attorney because you're not qualified and skilled. You know, I get that. <laughs> All right, so um, let's see what else we have here. AI tools. There is a, so many of these tools are coming along every week. It's hard to keep up, but here's one called Paw Trait Studio, just like it sounds, P-A-W, Trait Studio. This creates whimsical human portraits of your dog, cat, rabbit, guinea pig, and hamster, and transforms your photos into pet alter egos. So that'd be an interesting one to put on your Christmas card next year, I suppose. Uh, another one, CapGo.ai. It revolutionizes market research with ultra-fast data extraction into spreadsheets, offering unparalleled speed, efficiency, and simplicity through a user-friendly interface, and it's ideal for marketers and analysts. Pixplain by Merlin. Browsing extensions with Chrome, offering instant AI analysis of screenshots for enhanced comprehension, making complex content accessible. You know, this sounds like if you're scratching your head and saying, what is this website trying to do or say? The software will explain it to you. So we'll have that as well. Um, Chorus, K-O-R-U-S dot C-O. Founded by Deadmau5, is the AI-powered platform that revolutionizes music creation. Now we're getting into a really sore subject, because remember how touchy artists are about any kind of AI replicating what they're able to do. Create art, create music, create poetry, create anything of that uh, you know, style. Well, this apparently enables users to play, create, and remix music from their iconic labels. It's an innovative blend of technology and music for enthusiasts. Boy, this has copyright infringement written all over it. But anyway, if you're interested, check it out. K-O-R-U-S dot C-O. All right. 
You know, we're coming up on an hour here. Um, do have a couple of other items here, though. Uh, do you remember ByteDance? It's the Chinese owner of TikTok. Well, <clears throat> apparently they plan to launch a platform for creating AI-powered chatbots as well, competing with ChatGPT, Bard, Grok. This move on um, ByteDance's part uh, raises potential U.S. security concerns. Again, I think we've heard that before, due to the company's Chinese ties. The platform aimed to integrate with existing products could amplify ByteDance's influence in the AI space, but faces regulatory challenges in China and skepticism in the U.S. due to privacy and data security issues. All right, so ByteDance is getting into the act. Um, Agility Robotics. RoboFab in Salem, Oregon, set to be the first factory mass-producing humanoid robots. It will produce 10,000 units yearly, including the bipedal robot Digit designed for warehouse tasks. Now, here's a third one. Remember, we talked to about two of them already, Optimus, Tesla, and we've got uh, the one we talked about earlier. I can't remember the name anymore. <laughs> So here's the third one. It will produce 10,000 units annually. Digit is the name of their humanoid robot. This marks a significant advancement in robotics, they say, uh, offering versatile solutions for industries like Amazon. And with uh, China's similar ambitions by 2025, this development signals a major shift in industrial robotics, focusing now on humanoid forms for enhanced mobility, functionality, and of course, versatility, like we talked about earlier. Instead of that non-human looking robot repetitively doing the same task over and over again, these humanoid robots are adaptable to virtually any task that a human can do. So get used to it, guys. Eventually, you're going to be going on smoke breaks with a robot. Not sure what they'll smoke, though. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's see if we've got anything else here. And it looks like we're at an hour. You know, I enjoy doing these. Um, I hope you're enjoying joining us. I have a couple of questions. We have a couple of questions. All right. Chuck Longloy, there he is. He says, great subject matter and presentation. Thank you for sharing. As always, we enjoy you guys joining us. Rick Underhill agreed. Good work. To infinity and beyond, do you worry or are you concerned on how dependent we are or you are on AI? Because when one is overly dependent, you lose the control you once had thoughts. All right, I can't terminate this session. I got to answer this, Jesse, and it might take me more than two minutes. Yes, I am concerned. One of the biggest concerns I have, I fancy myself a writer, all right? I've, I've, um, I have written a couple of books, for example. Nothing published, but I, I, I'm a wordsmith. And I'm also OCD when it comes to writing. I will write and rewrite and rewrite and dig out the thesaurus and get just the right word, and I'm a per perfectionist. It's frustrating, but that's how I am. It's what I do. Invariably, when I go through my normal process of OCD writing and I come up with what I'm very proud of and I run that through ChatGPT4, I'm embarrassed, I'm disillusioned, and my ego takes a hit because it generally does a better job of what I have done. Now, yes, I'm becoming addicted. I am integrating it into my operations, into my writing style, into my image creation, into virtually everything that I do. Uh, you can even ask it advice, by the way, and it will give you a pretty good synopsis of uh, almost like therapy. So, um, and of course, it's fun, you know, it's, uh, it's, it can be distracting, but it's a lot of fun, and uh, you go down rabbit holes. It's like having a debate with one of your best, uh, you know, PhD friends or something. Um, I am concerned, because I wonder what will happen as I stop or I decline the exercise that my mind gets when I'm engaged in this kind of OCD writing. Will my language skills begin to diminish? Will I become so reliant that all I can do is basically babble and I let AI do all my work for me? Or will what one of my college professors acquainted me with like 40 years ago um, called retroactive inhibition? And the theory is that as you move new things into your consciousness, old things get displaced, get pushed out. 
And as I begin to migrate to relying more on augmentation like ChatGPT, just like I do my cell phone for phone numbers, I don't try to remember phone numbers anymore. I don't need to. It's all right here. I don't need to do mental arithmetic anymore. In fact, I'm probably as rusty as can be. I have a hard time doing multiplication these days, you know, two-digit multiple, single digit, I'm still okay, um, because I rely on this. Now, does that mean that that skill that has been replaced and pushed out was now um, allowed to introduce new skills that may be more valuable or more relevant? I don't think we're going to know that until we've um, gone down the road a bit, kick that can down the road a bit, as they say. So yes, I am concerned, and that's one of my biggest concerns. Um, losing control? Oh, you got me on another rabbit hole rant there. Mankind is unable to control themselves. They're unable to control this planet that we have been given as a home. Personally, I am looking forward to AI taking over and taking control and finally saying something like the parents just came back from vacation and found that the children had destroyed the house with partying and craziness and irresponsible behavior and saying, okay, kids, we're home now. We're going to put this place back in order. We're going to restore peace. We're going to clean it up. And you guys are going to have to comply. I think that it is the only way after thousands of years of allowing mankind to run this place that we can finally put this on track to where we're, A, no longer killing each other needlessly for no reason whatsoever, or political reasons, or religious reasons. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Anger, jealousy, you know, all of those uh, stupid, negative human emotions. And we eventually have overlords that are going to teach us how to turn this planet into a dystopian, utopian society. I'm sorry, I used the wrong term. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned that earlier, too, about Atlantis. I did, indeed, yes. Um, so that's my take on this. I hope that wasn't too long an answer. But um, I, I believe that if we, are, if we allow this to happen, that we will create a society where people will no longer have to do the nine to five going to work every day in order to meet mortgage payments, car payments, insurance payments, college tuition funds, and all that. We will have an age of abundance. Some of the most notable people on this planet already talk about this being a future reality. And if you really play it out logically, it makes sense. As we humans become less involved in needing to trade shekels and barter and, uh, you know, um, uh, use um, uh, the currency systems, and there, is a, there are machines that are generating everything we need, again, the question becomes, what do we do then? And uh, if you want to get the Hollywood version of it, watch the movie Idiocracy. And then you'll see the worst case scenario of what we would do once the machines are doing most everything for us. Well, Pete, there's another um, take here. There's a, st a study that was done recently that asked children in a late elementary school, middle school, early high school, what they want to be when they grow up. Almost universally, people want to be YouTubers. They want to be streamers. <laughs> they, want to, they want to be personalities on the internet. They want to have their own channel. They want to talk about whatever they want to talk about to an audience. And that's what they want to do because they're, they're all now growing up watching that. There is no television for them anymore. There's, there's still Disney and stuff like that out there for the very young kids. But the majority of, of kids nowadays are watching YouTube. They're watching creators that are... For them, they're you know whatever their those are their, their niche heroes. Is. Those yeah. are their role models. No, gone are the policemen, the firemen, the astronauts. Right. You know the um, uh, the doctors, the lawyers with driving Mercedes and uh, you know Beamers and uh, right. So the the uh, the new goal now is forget college, mm -hmm. forget maybe even high school. Yeah. Uh, get yourself a microphone, a camera, a camera, and sit at home <laughs> and do whatever. But now here's the thing, though: the, some of these streamers that do live streams or they. Even the people that just do YouTube videos, they produce a video every week or one every month, depending on how much time they put into it. But there, some of these kids, some of them are you know late 20s, mid 20s, um, 
early 20s they're they're all making millions of dollars doing this they're, yeah. they're making an insane amount of money because they get these audiences to watch them there's 10,000 people watching them live for example and they're all donating and they're subscribing or whatever it is so imagine getting to a point where we have robots or whatever autonomous things are taking over all of these menial jobs whether it's you know uh, fruit picking fruit or medicine medicine uh, yeah. or even fast food or what all these jobs that normally kids in high school would work or people just you know out of college or something would work mm -hmm. all that's going to be replaced everybody's online and they're even though this millionaire who is streaming about video games well they are a fan of this other person that's streaming about space right? right and so they're giving some of their money to this person so it becomes a community of people that are all online in this virtual world exchanging money towards each other while we have all of this autonomous stuff running the society for us yeah so that that is a future that i think is what people want at least the younger generation i don't know how that would work but that's what i can see it turning into where everybody is doing some kind of online work whether it's out of their house or, or whatever um, and then the the rest of the jobs that you would see as blue collar jobs are being handled by, by some machines. by by yeah autonomy somehow yeah you know uh, getting back to infinity and beyond's comment um, the um, success in social media and we just did a video on this by the way um, how th some of these uh, influencers that are wildly successful on YouTube are creating content dribble that is really offensive to the senses, but the majority of people tend to appreciate it, like it, and feed it by subscribing and watching it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we're probably not helping by doing these podcasts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, this is the kind, type of content that we would want to, to succeed. And there's other content out right. there, too, where at first glance it doesn't look like it would be valuable because the person is using harsh language the whole time. They're talking in... Sure idioms and it's it's very you know strange how they're presenting it but the audience is able to digest their information better than watching a 60 minutes presentation right so there's one out there called something um history. 60 minutes makes you think yeah the stuff that uh, where you've got a scantily clad dancer doesn't make you think it appeals to your emotions well so if you're talking about yeah the the sexual content or that kind of stuff yeah. that's that's different yeah or the polarized, you know, the uh, extreme left-wing views, right-wing uh, uh, views, religious views, you know, anything like that, um, mm -hmm. doesn't kick in critical thinking very much. We're, we're going way out on a tangent here. <laughs> uh, Clark Schwartz is laughing, all right, to infinity and beyond. He says, the kids want to become what they're growing into it. The generation of the 30-year-olds or older were not born into this. Good point. Yeah. I mean, the, the original first people that went viral on YouTube are the 30 to 35-year-olds, and they are all, that's that first wave of really popular YouTubers. They're all in their 30s now. Social experiment time. Um, I'm from a generation, last century, grew up in the 50s and 60s. Um, murder, rape, Violence was not as prevalent back then. We all watched and observed as the video gaming industry started to take hold. You could actually play games online rather than going outside, running through your backyard, through your neighbor's yard, going out in the woods or whatever and having fun and climbing trees and all that. Our entertainment became, or the entertainment then became, you know, screens. And the screens naturally appealed to what sold the most video games, which generally was violence, shooting people. Uh, not just shooting them, but actually being able to blow them apart and watching their innards explode. And it became more graphic. It became more realistic. And we were all watching, my generation were all watching and saying, what impact is this going to have on future generations? Will this desensitize them to, um, you know, murder, killings, violence, and all of that? The only statistic that you can uh, offer to support that is violence is definitely on an increase since then yeah i would think i think we need to probably revisit that the violent crime has decreased significantly since 1990 it's it's not on an increase what's what is increased is its visibility due to the internet 
Okay, good news, point. News stories going viral, shootings going viral, things being right in your face that are happening across the country that you never would have seen make it appear that there's significantly more violence. But violent crime, specifically here in the United States, has decreased every year, year over year, since 1990. I did not know that. Yeah. Um, and you're right, the information age definitely would um, make that much more visible. Um, you know, the wars currently going on are highly visible. They're in yeah. our living rooms every There's night. There's drones flying around filming the yeah. whole Ukraine conflict. Yeah. During World War II, you had to go out on a street corner and buy a newspaper. And, and, that, and that newspaper was already talking about things that were weeks old. Exactly. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. It looks like we've, we have gone and, uh, um, uh, down some rabbit holes here. We appreciate all of you joining us for this. And we'll probably have a rant video coming out of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can go into some of these some of these topics. But anyway, um, Merry Christmas to everyone, and I don't mind saying it that way. I hope I didn't oh, offend anybody. Real quick, we got one more that I think you find interesting. Yeah, another here. one. All right. I hope you all have a wonderful uh, uh, holidays here with your family and your loved ones. Hendrik uh, Eber says, "I live stream usually about space and music." Oh, I am fifty three. There you go. So okay. hey, streaming can be for anybody. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you for joining us. Again, Merry Christmas. Have a wonderful holiday. We'll see you guys next week.